All right, so that is just an example. And some of these are organized around projects. So this is just for reptile images. And you can see the darkness of the points and the density of them. So just like birds, there's many for North America. But even looking across Africa for reptiles, there's actually quite a few photographs that are observations of reptiles across Africa, which is neat. And these data are also pushed to GBIF. So other places where you can upload images, Amphibia Web, which we'll talk about later as a resource, has many images in it that are organized in different ways. And all of these images are actually submitted by photographers like you and I. Uh, and when you browse their data, you can see the names and whether or not there's an account, like a written account about those species, but also the photos. And photos and sound recordings are submitted here by us, right? And if you look at one of the observations, here's a photo I submitted a while ago. This is a, an image of a, a frog in the field that has you know, a locality. It notes that it's the holotype. It has a specimen record and things like that. So you can upload this sort of metadata um, to a place like this. So I'm going to switch gears and talk a little bit about specimen prep. So before we go into the field, one of the most important things is to make sure that we have the things that we need we're not going to be able to get at the nearest village, right? Uh, so probably a lot of things that are on this list we will not find in Mundemba. So for herpetology and, and also for ornithology, we depend a lot on formalin and formaldehyde for preserving animals. Uh, so that's something that I think we'll probably talk about uh, in groups this afternoon when we're talking about what chemicals do we need to acquire. Uh, formalin for preservation. Ethanol we use for preserving tissue samples. Uh, we also use methanol for preserving blood, uh, blood samples uh, and also doing other types of tissue preps. And we also need chemicals for euthanasia. So Mark mentioned just doing chest compression for birds and amphibians and reptiles. We tend to do it by administering some sort of chemical that causes the animal to essentially fall asleep and die. And so we have a couple different ones. Probably, are we, I'm, I brought MS-222. Is that what you brought? You brought chlorotone, yeah. So we have a couple different um, chemicals that are used for euthanasia that are again approved by our institutions for you know, administering to these animals for euthanasia. So it's important to have these because these are hard to get. Um, we also have different options for sterilizing some of our tools. So we can just use water and wipe them clean with a paper towel. We can essentially sterilize like a scalpel blade for taking tissue samples by using a lighter if we want. Um, we will use hydrogen peroxide some to sterilize the material. We also use bleach for sterilizing our bags so that we don't cross contaminate frogs that we put in a bag um, if they have chytrid fungus. And we're interested in surveying those frogs to see if they have chytrid. Well, if we then put new frogs in that bag, they're also going to be cross-contaminated with the chytrid from the previous frogs that were in the bag. So we'll clean our bags with a little water and bleach as well. Uh, and the other things that are really important uh, for a lot of our work are plastic trays, which we use for preserving the specimens, and I'll show those in a moment. Paper towels are also very important for our fixing trays. Forceps and syringes, these are just things that they're hard to get, so you really have to plan ahead before you leave a major city. You can definitely get most of these things in Douala or Yaoundé. Um, I've been getting them there for quite a while. And most of these chemicals we actually get in country. So you can get them um, in country in like Cameroon. And for instance, formalin, sometimes you have to be creative. Uh, we sometimes get formalin from morgues uh, because they're preserving bodies or they're preserving uh, tissue samples for pathology. And so sometimes if you run out of chemicals, you can be creative about where you can get these chemicals from. So this is just um, an example of what are the types of things that are in our prep kits uh, for preserving specimens and taking tissue samples. So it's always important for us to have forceps and usually quite a few. And we brought a lot of extra because there's quite a few of you that will be working with us. Scissors for cutting tags, scale bars, and measuring tapes for measuring uh, frogs, measuring lizards, the tail length, things like that. Um, parafilm, we use this parafilm is essentially very thin, flexible plastic, and we use it, we use it for sealing the tops of tubes like this. So for instance, when we collect tadpoles, we'll put a tadpole in, put a little bit of formalin in, and then we'll seal it, but we don't want the formalin getting on everything. So we'll wrap a very thin amount of flexible plastic around the top to seal it very tightly. Um, we have dissecting tools, and dissecting tools are really important for all of us for taking tissue samples, whether or not those are small scissors and forceps and scalpels and having a fair amount of scalpel blades or razor blades is really important to us, as well as other tools like scales for weighing 
or formalin buffer. And so one of the things that we do with formaldehyde in the field is that we buffer it so that it's not highly acidic. And so for a lot of small vertebrates, if the formalin is highly acidic, it can actually cause decalcification of the bones, which depending on what you're going to do if you want to study the skeleton, it can really badly affect not only the tissues, but the skeleton. So we try to have the, the formalin buffered to around neutral pH. And to do that, we actually bring along some salts with us that we'll dump into the formalin when we make it up in the field. So we do most of our preparation in prep tents like this, like we mentioned. And I think probably depending, everybody does it slightly differently. Uh, but the most important thing overall is to just be highly organized before you begin. Right? And so here you can see sort of we have all of our specimens laid out. These are swabs for chytrid samples, our tissue, sam uh, tissue tubes. And when we start going through uh, specimens, you'll note that we have a specimen number, a genus name, and then we have pieces of information. We actually lay out before we preserve specimens, we already write out most of this, right? And then we label our specimens that are still alive by field tags, and everything is organized. So we know what numbers we're going to be using for that day. We then pre-label our tissue tubes corresponding to the same numbers. So these are these very small tubes like this in boxes that are filled up with ethanol or a salt buffer, or if we have liquid nitrogen, they're just flash frozen. And then inside a lot of those tubes, we'll write the name or the number and usually the name of the species on the outside of the tube. And then we cut up, these are just all pre-made labels corresponding to our field tags. It's just on a very heavy duty piece of paper. We'll cut the number out of this and put it inside the tube so that for every tissue sample, we have not only a label on the outside of the tube, but a label on the inside of the tube. And that's important because the outside of the tube, uh, the, the label can be rubbed off um, just accidentally, or it can be rubbed off because alcohol, in a lot of cases, can wash off pens. Uh, so having you know, multiple labeling systems is important because if you have a tissue sample that has no label on it, it's essentially a worthless tissue sample because then you don't know where it came from, when it came from. Uh, so it's really important to have as much backup of labeling as we can. And we do the same with labeling our, tissue, our, our tubes that we put tadpoles in. We label them on the outside. We write out pieces of information on paper and then put it inside the tube as well. So this is what a lot of our prep tables look like. And just like Mark and Town showed yesterday, one thing that's really important to notice is that if we can, if we have multiple people, it really helps preparation having people working together, usually each person doing a different job. And so in this case, you know, Brian is back here taking photographs and those specimens then move to Greg who is euthanizing the animals. They're coming to me to tissue sample them and they're going to Dan who preserves them. And so, you know, having every day, you know, who's doing what really helps speed up, especially when Rafe showed and there's six boxes of specimens they prepared in a single day. That doesn't happen if you yourself are doing every single one of those stages, right? So we do other types of sampling. The field here is swabbing for chytrid fungus. So just for those of you that don't know, chytrid fungus is something we'll talk about a lot as frog biologists. Chytrid is a, a type of fungus that infects the skin. It causes thickening of the skin. It interferes with the uh, physiology of the frog and eventually causes its death in many species. And because it infects the skin, one way that we can sample for the presence of it is to take a swab, a cotton swab, and rub it on the skin. And that collects skin cells of the frog. And if those skin cells have the fungus in them, then what we can do is we can test for the presence of the fungus DNA. And so the main way that we do a lot of screening for um, chytrid fungus is by screening the, for the DNA of the fungus based on these swabs of frog skin cells. We also do things like taking weight and length Probably we take weight a lot less than we take length. And so here you can note that for this individual Leptopelis tree frog, we've noted uh, its snout vent length, how long it is, whether or not we took a BD sample for it. Um, we'll note the sex in the field notes. What you'll notice here is that we did not note that the tissue sample was taken. And that's because in our field work, we take a tissue sample of every single frog. And so we just simply don't write that down. Uh, we record it in our spreadsheets, but in our basic field notes, we end up not taking it because it's just assumed that we took tissue samples. So when we take tissue samples, it's important for us to have uh, scalpels and take it. we make an incision generally for amphibians and reptiles, an incision somewhere on the body and take a small piece of liver. That's our standard, but we also take other tissue types sometimes like muscle. Um, sometimes in snakes, we take heart. 
And having those other tissue types can be important for different types of analyses. And you'll notice here that there's these little dishes. And the reason is, is because we have a process, at least that we use, where we rinse off our materials in between each specimen. We put them in a little bit of hydrogen peroxide, that's dilute, so it's not strong hydrogen peroxide, just dilute, uh, dilute hydrogen peroxide to sterilize it. And then we rinse them off again, then we wipe them off, and then we start with the next specimen. So we usually have a few sets of dissecting tools in rotation at a single time. So it allows us to sterilize one set while we're using the next set. And the idea there is that we don't want to cross-contaminate the samples, right? So we're, we have this frog species, we've taken a tissue sample, and now the forceps have the blood of that frog species on it. We don't want to cross-contaminate that with the next frog species that we're sampling. So just to give you an idea of what this looks like, this is Greg who's taking tissue samples of a, a snake. He's made an incision here where he's pulling out, um, this is all snake liver. So we'll take a large piece of liver and then we'll chop that piece of liver up into multiple tubes. And that's, these are the tissue samples we use for genetic analyses. We do other types of things that you'll, um, hopefully we're prepared to do in the field. So I've brought along slides for a lot of reptiles. For instance, reptiles have blood parasites. Many lizards have malaria. They're not the same type of malaria specifically that we'd have, but there are other types of malarias that lizards have. So one way of doing that is that we can use the tissue sample to screen for the, uh, to use genetic tools to screen for the presence of um, a blood parasite. But we can also take a smear, a little bit of blood and smear it on a glass slide and we'll fix it in methanol and then that later we can hand that to a parasitologist who can actually look for the presence of the parasite inside the blood cells, right? And so that's actually a really important piece of information as far as whether these animals have blood parasites. Um, and so that information is, is, is useful to us as well. We do things also like preserving stomach content. Sometimes in uh, amphibians and reptiles we'll take out the entire uh, gastrointestinal tract, so including the stomachs and the intestines, and preserve that whole. In this particular case, we'd actually dissected out the stomach contents because we had a bet about what it had eaten. So this is a large gray uh, a snake, and this is a catfish that it had eaten that same evening. And the reason we had done this is that there's two choices for snakes. So one is that you can either remove the stomach contents and preserve them separately, or you have to inject a lot of formalin inside those stomach contents. And the problem is you have to do one or the other because there can be such a large volume of tissue inside a snake's stomach that if you don't take the time to preserve those contents, they will simply rot and they will ruin, ruin the specimen that you make, right? And so you either have to take the stomach contents out uh, this is most specific to snakes. We don't really worry about this for frogs. We don't really worry about this for small lizards. But for a very large lizard, like a big monitor lizard, um, or a very large snake, they can have this very large prey item inside that if we don't take care to preserve that as well, then it starts rotting and it ruins the entire specimen. And so you either have to dissect it out or um, preserve the stomach and intestines separately. Okay, so this is just to give you an idea of how we preserve specimens. So we will lay them out in flat boxes like this. Cecilia, I think this is Wilbur here. This is uh, from Uganda. So this is, we, we have uh, essentially plastic boxes with paper towels. And we have a little bit of formalin in the bottom of this tray just to make it damp and make the frog stick to it. And what you'll see is Greg is taking great care to arrange the arms and the fingers. And so these are um, some casinas like I showed running. It's probably one of these is actually the one that was running. And what you'll notice is that we've taken great care to lay, lay out its arms. In, we've generally lay out the arms so they're perpendicular to the body and then the, the hands that are perpendicular to that and we spread out the fingers, we sp um, spread out the toes. And the reason that we do that is because in a lot of frog taxonomy uh, and other types of projects that we would like to do with these animals, we need to be able to measure those fingers, measure those limbs easily, and we would hope that the measurements between this animal and this animal are consistent. So if this animal is preserved where the legs are straight out and this animal is preserved where the legs are in a different direction, it's gonna make it very hard to take measurements that are consistent from specimen to specimen. And if you ever go and work with really old museum collections, you will appreciate this because a lot of older museum collections were basically taken by having a dead frog throwing an alcohol and it's preserved in you know a million different directions and it's really very difficult to work with when you're trying to take measurements for describing new species and things like that so we take great care in laying out specimens 
um, and we end up filling up fixing trays like this. Uh, so you'll see that we've you know, taken as much effort as we can to squeeze as many frogs into these trays as we can. Uh, and Rafe showed yesterday pictures of snakes coiled up. And so for different uh, groups of amphibians and reptiles, we have different ways in which we lay out the animals in the fixing tray that tries to maximize the information we can get from them later on. So we don't preserve snakes in the same way that we preserve <coughs> frogs, for instance, because snakes don't have limbs, so we don't worry about this. Um, one thing that we do with a lot of larger specimens, and you'll see us do in the field, we use syringes really for two main purposes in the field. The first is to inject a chemical for euthanasia, for killing the animal, and the second is that we use syringes for injecting formalin inside larger specimens, because if we don't take care to do that, they really won't preserve and they'll start to rot. So that's, that's true for big snakes, but it's also even true for a very fat toad. So we will take formalin and we will pump it in using a syringe, and we do that a lot with snakes, so that's what Dan is doing here, is he will also make small uh, pricks using the tip of the syringe down the body, and that helps formalin infiltrate into the body and preserve the animal. So, I mean, if we're going to take the effort to make these specimens, we really want to take as much care as we can to make these specimens the best possible specimens for us for the future. So we also do other types of prep. So I asked Rafe to send me an image, and this is the one he sent me. Um, so this is a monitor lizard. This is a male monitor lizard. And so this is the hemipenes. This is one hemipenes. This is the left hemipenes. There's a right hemipenes on this side. And we actually can use syringes to, we usually fill them with water, uh, sometimes formalin, and we can inject them into the base of the tail, and we can cause the hemipenes to avert. So normally when they're averted for mating in lizards and snakes, they're filled with blood. But of course the animal is dead, so it's not going to do that. So we can take a syringe full of water and do that and pop out the hemipenes. One reason we do that is because you can see these spines and these folds it turns out that you can tell certain lizards and snakes apart by looking at their hemipenes. And so it's very useful to have this done in the field because it's actually not that easy to do it based on preserved specimens. This is essentially like a sack that's inside the, um, the base of the tail that trying to get it out and look at it in a specimen that's been fixed for 50 years it turns out to be very difficult sometimes. It can be done, but it's not that easy. So we do a lot of this in the field. In some animals, we'll actually put a string around the base just to keep it filled with water for a period of time while it fixes, and then we take that off. So I threw this in, actually, as Mark was talking. Uh, so Mark mentioned the fact that even for birds now, they don't do dry skeleton preps. We almost never do skeleton preps in the field for amphibians and reptiles. There might be very rare cases where we would, um, but for the most part, we never make skeleton preps in the field. And so there are technologies now that enable us to look at the specimens, uh, skeletons. So this is a small frog that's only about 20 millimeters snout vent length. And this is using um, essentially a type of X-ray called computed tomography. So it's basically X-ray in combination with a computer. It's used mostly in medicine. Um, but we can use that on our scientific specimens, and it's great because it allows us to digitally take apart skeletons. And so this is looking inside its inner ear. Uh, so we, we've recently started using this a lot uh, in our museum collection for getting a lot of information out of very fragile small things. And we can even do that for soft tissue. So this is, um, these are the muscles, and we can reconstruct the muscles in three dimensions. Uh, this is its brain, which we can reconstruct in three dimensions. And so, we don't need to make these type of preparations in the field, which is great because this is just one more thing we don't need to do in the field because we can do a lot of this in the lab or in a museum later on. So this is kind of the cleanup on the end of talking about specimens. So one thing that we really do take care with, especially for amphibians, is cleaning our bags so we don't cross... Mostly we do this if we're interested in uh, swabbing for chytrid. So if there's chytrid on a frog that's in a bag, that chytrid could then be in the bag. So if we put a new frog in there, the chytrid from the old frog will get on the new frog and sort of messes up our sampling for chytrid. So we will, you know, for instance, put a little bit of bleach um, and water inside the bag and then set them out in the sun to dry. You could also simply set them out in the field to, to dry overnight, but as you know, we work in the rain a lot of times. Sometimes things don't dry, and so we use a little combination of bleach plus trying to put them out in the sun to dry. 
These are one of the most important parts is once they're done in a fixing tray, we then have to do something with the specimens, right? And so we transport our specimens um, in buckets or small containers, and we, we really carefully pack these animals inside because we've taken all of this effort to preserve them in a particular way. If we then cram them inside a jar, they're, we're going to ruin that whole effort that we made to preserve them. And so we, this is in the bottom of a bucket where they're carefully laid out in a single layer on a paper towel, then we put paper towels on top and a new layer and paper towels and a new layer and with a little bit of formalin. The problem is that all of these have formalin and so if we want to put them back um, in a museum collection or we want to transport them on an airplane, we really need to get rid of the formalin. And so when they come back to our museum collections, we will rinse them uh, in water for a small amount of time to get rid of the formalin and then we transfer them to alcohol. But we also do that in the field and so this is just in a bathroom somewhere I don't know if this is in Cameroon or Uganda, where we're basically soaking specimens in water. We sometimes will simply put them in a bathtub and spray them down for a while and uh, let the water run if we don't have enough buckets. And that's just getting rid of the formalin because you can only imagine trying to travel internationally with preserved dead animals that it raises a lot of attention from people on uh, airplanes. And so we try and get rid of the smell of formalin as much as possible uh, and we um, package them very carefully so that you know they're not ruined when they're coming back and I think that's what I had so it's pretty thorough and then Rafe is going to tell you a little bit more in the details of you know how we actually deal specifically with um, like audio data and things like that